Welcome everybody to this last uh, program of the Hexman debates this year. And a very special welcome to Paul Rogers. Paul has loyally supported the Hexham debates from our beginnings in 2007. And he's returned every year, bar two, I think, since that. He usually winds up the season as a grand finale, <laughs> as indeed he's doing again today. Paul will speak for about 30 minutes and then take your questions, which if you type them into the chat box, I'll pick them up and uh, relay them to Paul so that everybody can hear. So back in September last year, Paul suggested the topic of uh, integrity and truth in international politics. Bang on cue, Boris Johnson left office yesterday after the Privileges Committee found that he'd misled Parliament and Donald Trump was indicted of 37 federal crimes. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin and his alternative realities are announced daily from the Kremlin. Paul, there's plenty of material for you today. Welcome, as ever, to the Hexham Debates and over to you. Caroline, thanks very much, and uh, it's really nice to be back. And uh, I don't know how I'm going to handle this topic, I must admit. And when I looked at the title just a week or so ago, I realised, gosh, how do you handle that now? And of course, this morning, it's even more so with these sterling examples of the lack of uh, integrity and, uh, and truth in politics. So where do we go? Now, the, 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 the words which accompanied the, uh, the title uh, spoke about Britain in particular, and we are looking at international politics, which narrows it down a bit. Uh, and also, I think what we need to do on an occasion like this is to think positively as well. While we might need to sort of summarise things and look in a fairly short way at the many problems and maybe pick the main ones, uh, it's no good concentrating just on the problems. There are solutions. And I think what I, I want to sort of put across is the idea that a country like Britain, if it had rather different policies, if you could imagine a general election which was called for September, uh, or let's say October, and that a, uh, a party got in, we don't have a current candidate, a party got in which was really looking to face up to the problems, then what could be the changes in the next sort of uh, three or four years? And what impact could they have more internationally? Uh, so that's what I want to try and do, but we better go through the nature of the problems first. And I mean, there are so many in a way. I mean, you can group them as we've done in one or two of these discussions in recent years under three broad headings. Um, economic problems, uh, global and national, um, environmental problems, especially climate breakdown, but also biodiversity loss, and then security problems, uh, particularly the tendency to fight wars and fight wars, which cause huge havoc and often don't come to a, a, in any way a good conclusion. Um, so in a sense, I, I still think those are the three main ones. Now that leaves aside specific areas, uh, the risk of another pandemic, and the fact we seem to have learned so little from the, the recent very bad one, uh, I think the issue of AI is important and, and likely to grow so. I think the risk of uh, genetic engineering and engineering the right kind, wrong kind of bug is a serious one. Uh, and, and certainly there are others. Uh, there is always the nuclear risk. And we're seeing that in a small but very significant way in Ukraine. But I think it's probably best just we've got half an hour and we want to throw this open. So I think it's best just to concentrate on the three main ones. And again, very briefly to, to go through the first two in terms of their extent and then look at the third one slightly more, the security one. Now, on the uh, economic side, what we, I think, have to admit now is the world is becoming, I would say, dangerously unequal. Uh, there's so many people on the relative margins worldwide. We're talking about billions of people and a relatively few, maybe a billion or so, maybe one in eight, who are really doing pretty well. Uh, and I mean, that is going to produce all kinds of problems in, in the near term. Now, we can go into the details of the extent to which that is the sort of the strength of sort of ideologies like market fundamentalism or neoliberalism, call it what you will. Uh, but I think the thing is, what we need to accept is we do have a very unequal world and people are more and more aware of that. 
both nationally and globally. The, you'll probably remember, at least the older ones among us will remember, what, 30 to 40 years ago, what you might loosely call pop sociology used terms like the revolution of rising expectations. And the belief was back in, what was it, the 1970s, 80s and so on, that while there were big differences in wealth and poverty, everybody was doing rather better. There was this quaint idea of what was the simile, um, most better for rather, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think what we've seen progressively in the last 20 years in particular is the revolution of frustrated expectations as people get more and more concerned about their own position. It's one of the factors, only one of them, which is also leading to bigger population movements. People in very difficult um, monetary circumstances, so desperate that they feel they have to, to move. And I think a very good indication of this is the fact that so many of the young migrants who make it <clears throat> via the boats to Britain are relatively young men. And of course, this causes concern among the right wing. But the real, real is, reason is that in many parts of the world, an extended family will get enough money together for at least one person to try to get somewhere where they can earn sufficient money to send back to their wider family and maybe even get other family members to join them. So it is a natural thing. But that is a very big impact, which can have sort of real political dimension. There are many other aspects to this, but I think we are at risk of seeing more revolts from the margins in the future. Uh, on the environment side, again, remember, we're just looking at it from the bad angle. In the environment side, obviously, um, almost certainly week by week, if not day by day, we're seeing more and more examples of climate breakdown actually starting to happen. And that's a very big change, I think, from 20 years ago, in some ways, even from five years ago. It's happening before our eyes, and you saw it in the conditions in New York and parts of the eastern seaboard of the United States and Canada just in the last two or three days. There are always examples somewhere, and it looks like we may be heading for record temperatures uh, for the time of year, even in Britain, in the coming week. So I think people now are beginning to be aware of that, but there's a tremendous uh, opposition to do anything seriously about it because we're dealing with huge changes, revolutionary changes almost in the way we live, but we're going to get in uh, on top of climate breakdown. And the one thing you have to remember here is that in a sense, um, if you take the really good actions now, then that's going to have an effect within sort of minor effect within five to 10 years. But the full impact of what we've already done is going to take the best part of 30 years to bring things down. Remember that we've been here before on a smaller scale. Back in the early 1980s, there was a sudden realization that a particular group of um, pollutants, the chlorofluorocarbons, the CFCs, were beginning to see the breakdown of the ozone layer, which protects life on Earth from excess UV radiation. And because that was so immediate and so specific, action was taken remarkably quickly. I mean, it was only really discovered the extent of it in 1982, 83, by the British Antarctic Survey. And that, we had the Montreal Convention in 1987, 1988. So action was taken within four or five years. But even now, the ozone layer is slowly repairing itself. It's not completely there. So it's taken about, what, nearly 40 years to do that. So it's a long-term process, but it can be done, and we'll explore that in a moment. Then the final one, which I want to spend a little bit of time on, because we've never looked at properly before, is this whole issue of the nature of how we look at security. Well, there's been some very good work on, done on this by the Rethinking Security Group. I'd certainly recommend you look at their work, rethinkingsecurity.org. It's British-based, but it's a combination of um, activists, academics, professional mediators and others who essentially bring together a coalition of like-minded groups and try and work out what would be good policies for Britain. And I must say, a lot of what I'm saying now is for it taken directly from some of their reports and writings. What I want to just say here is just look at the nature of this military industrial complex, the way we look at security. You could apply this to virtually any country with reasonably sizable armed forces and a reasonable defense industry. You have what Eisenhower called a military industrial complex, and that is a very inward looking thing. I'm going to have to re refer to notes a little bit here. It's not something I can speak of straight off. Uh, so bear with me if I'm looking down on occasions. But in terms of how the, the system, if you like, the complex 
understand security? Well, for a start, it privileges national security. Uh, it doesn't look at security in any other form. For most people, security in their ordinary lives is much more related to their economic circumstances, social problems, family problems, and the rest. And at present, for many people in Britain, many, many uh, families in Britain in particular, uh, basically not enough money to get by in a way they could only a couple of years ago. And that is really what security means to them. But that's now ha not how it's viewed. And basically, our military industrial complex, as it works now, combination of the military themselves, the civil servants, uh, the arms companies, the think tanks, the universities, and to an extent some trade unions are all in the business of maintaining high levels of spending to ensure national security. Uh, it, it, it's to advance the national interest, but these are decided by a relatively small community of people. And in the way, they tend to focus on the short-term things rather than very long-term drivers. So admittedly, the very difficult problems in Ukraine at present are being met by a rapid increase in defense spending or military spending right across Western Europe and beyond. Um, we're seeing the world military expenditure uh, basically exceeding, was it $2, tr tr $2 trillion a year from this year, according to the Stockholm Peace Research Institute. I think also what the attitude within this tends to be is maintaining control rather than getting underneath and underneath and looking at the real problems and where they're coming from. We'll come back to that in a minute. And I think the problem is that um, there's a disproportionate influence of the business community, understandably. We do live in a shareholder capitalist economy and they have to be about making profits. And if you're making profit from war, basically, you may not want wars necessarily, but you certainly want people to be edgy enough to spend a lot of money on conventional armaments. And I think that really is a problem which is really quite deeply embedded. I think there tends to be also, and I think David G., uh, a Quaker who's done a lot of work on this, used the term, a preference of values associated with the hegemonic masculinity. And what it means that is that that reduces the discourse to a calculus of threats and coercive, coercive responsibilities. And I think it's spot on on that. It's a culture, if you like. Now, compare that with the sorts of things that Rethinking Security is saying. They're saying that essentially security is a freedom not to be, it should be seen as a freedom not to feel insecure. You turn the whole thing around. And in that way, it's a common right. It's not restricted to any one group or peoples anywhere across the world. And also, as an important point, again, I think very Quaker thinking, it is a patient process. It's not something that you have immediate answers. And that means, I think, in the current circumstances, it is not easy to see a very quick way out of this very grievous war in Ukraine. Uh, the reasons for that go back a long way. And there have been several occasions back in the early 1990s or in the mid 2000s when it might have been possible to prevent this kind of circumstance developing. It's very difficult to bring this to an end, but not impossible. And we could perhaps discuss this a bit. But I think the key thing is security should be seen as a shared responsibility. So if we're looking at all of that, uh, and let's try and apply it to, uh, to Britain. And what I want to do is for just about 10 minutes or so is to imagine what I said at the start. There was a general election in October. What kind of policies uh, should uh, a government like that in Britain uh, actually begin to think about in terms of turning things around? And again, I'm going to have to look at my notes very quickly. Say, I'm thinking about this half the week and hastily put together some ideas. Um, obviously, there are some things which are very easy and straightforward on what you might call the military security side. Uh, you know, the big systems. One is that any country the size of Britain has some significance by virtue of its size, its economy, maybe its long-term history, and its involvements with a number of international bodies. I think, in a sense, in the security context, it actually lost a lot in leaving the EU. Because before that, you had a very strong, um, essentially, transatlantic connection you had a European connection. You also had the underrated, but potentially much better Commonwealth connection, which is more north-south. And that was a rather unusual situation. Britain has, to some extent, given up on one of those. And of course, the world has changed as far as the Commonwealth is concerned. 
but it doesn't mean that it's gone for good. We also have substantial armed forces. I think even now, uh, if it's a direct comparison, we're the third or fourth largest spender on the military in the world. Uh, I think is exceeded by the United States, China, and possibly just about Russia or India. But essentially, we are one of the big spenders. What are the kind of things that a country such as us could do? Um, well, easily enough, put much more effort in terms of getting really good civil servants and public servants, or one or sort rather, working at the UN level. Put good people, some of your best people, into the UN system. Uh, be very supportive of some of the key agencies. I would name, obviously, World Health Organization, Food and Agricultural Organization, and others, the World Meteorological Organization, for sure. These are all basically, uh, and probably the Food and Agricultural Organization, bureaucratic though it is. I'd like to see more support for those, both in terms of the funding and also the demands for improved efficiency. Uh, the UN bureaucracy can be a real monster to behold. And you're only going to get an improvement in that if leading countries actually play major roles. I think Britain, at the present at least, along with four other countries, is a permanent member of the Security Council. Use that in a more positive way. But this has to be, in a sense, part of a, a process, I suppose, of uh, just seeing British foreign policy in a common function rather than a national function. It's not an easy one to do, but basically you're saying, Think globally rather than purely nationally. And what can you do to change things around? I think as far as the uh, armed forces are concerned, uh, this is an area which in some ways is fascinating. If you're a person who believed in Britain's having sort of um, formal, normal defences, if you like, if you don't take a pacifist agenda, then certainly there's the issue of the UN peacekeeping efforts. Uh, Britain has not been one of the major players over the years, with exceptions in what was it, Umprofor I, uh, back in crime in Croatia. And essentially, when the British armed forces have actually done peacekeeping, they turned out to be quite good at it. And although I can't say directly on work done in Britain, I do know a former colleague uh, at Bradford who was uh, from Canada, stayed with us for several years, and he actually produced a very interesting study because he had a brother who was one of the Canadian peacekeepers in former Yugoslavia. And by using that, he was able to spend some time there and sort of discuss the roles that the peacekeepers were playing and what they thought of the roles. Now, as you know, historically, Canada's had quite a major role in peacekeeping. It had some major problems in its activities in the Middle East at one stage and sort of retracted a little bit from that. But what he found was that the Canadian ordinary troops, uh, not necessarily the sort of the officer class, uh, actually began to embrace what they were doing. Uh, they actually really got quite enthusiastic about peacekeeping in an extremely difficult environment, a completely different challenge to what they were normally trained for, but essentially something which badly needed doing. So and I think there's, if a country like Britain is prepared to do more on that, then I think that would be really a very good thing to do and pretty good for our armed forces as well. Uh, there are many ways in which you can aid that. There's been an effort by the Italian government in rebuilding its navy, it was pretty run down before, to try and get some of the ships that start off almost from the keel up designed to be dual purpose. So in other words, I think they have one amphibious uh, ship. You know, normally it would sort of be sending troops ab uh, ashore in some sort of war zone, but it also has the capability to be far more active at a time of a national disaster. And so essentially, this is a ship, I think it's nearing completion. I'm not up to date on this. I was looking at this three or four years ago. But essentially, it's a ship which um, can, where well, it's already got the basic medical facilities uh, to handle a much larger number than its crew and a much, much number number of casualties than would be the norm for a ship of its class. So in other words, basically, it could be turned into a kind of casualty receiving station if it was offshore of a country hit by a bad air earthquake or even a bad storm. Um, it has the capability, if I remember it rightly, uh, to produce far more electricity than the ship requires in any circumstances. So it's capable of actually anchoring offshore or very near shore or even ashore facilities allow, you know, alongside, and then connecting up to a local grid. 
to actually feed electricity directly into a port. It's that kind of idea. It would also have um, the facilities for a number of different kinds of containers. So in other words, you would have containers ready, which could be loaded onto a ship and personnel taken aboard within sort of 36, 48 hours to actually go to you know, a, a crisis point somewhere in the Mediterranean. And if you think, no, that can't be done. Well, I'm old enough to remember the extraordinary speed with the, with the British uh, prepared almost from scratch the Falklands Task Force back in, what was it, uh, uh, April 1982. And the speed with which that was done was astonishing. If you actually pre-plan uh, the ability to respond to a civil emergency, then you know, that's something that, again, you could use the armed forces. Um, they are good logistically. Uh, they can be good in transport. And while most aid agencies will prefer to work with civil transporting agencies, they will work with the military as well. Uh, it's not similar attitudes, but it can change. I'm just trying to give examples of different kinds of thinking. And I think it, there's a lot to be said for this because it changes almost the attitude that a country might actually have to security. Um, there are other specific things in Britain. Obviously, uh, and this extends us beyond the sort of the security side, uh, I would say we need to reverse uh, the increase in defence spending and critically reverse the huge cutbacks in, in international development assistance. Now, let it be said that development assistance is a pity dodgy term to use because so much of it does not necessarily involve money going to the areas that most need it. I'll do an anecdote on this. Right at the start of my career, weirdly, I actually started off as a plant pathologist. So I was working on crop research. And in fact, my PhD involved quite a lot of work on farms. It was very fortunate. It was applied as very theoretical. I then got a, a, an incredible job. This was the Labour government in the late 1960s, where I got employed to lecture at the college I was at, Imperial College, in plant pathology. Uh, but to do it for, uh, I think it's a three to five year contract, on condition that I spent up to 80% of the time uh, working in the Global South. And so you had a stability in terms of your career, but you could go and work wherever you were required. Now, what actually ended up happening was that I went to work in East Africa. I was based in Nairobi and then uh, Uganda. This is in the days of the um, uh, East African community before Armin came in and wrecked things in Uganda. And essentially the three countries got together on a crop breeding program for sugarcane, uh, not to basically uh, export sugar cane. What they wanted was to actually be able to produce enough for their own population and then use land for growing other more necessary crops. So we had to brew, breed new varieties of sugar cane. And my job was to make sure that the new ones were resistant to the normally occurring pests and diseases. Now, the reason I mentioned this is my salary came from a local salary which was provided from the East African community at local rates. But, you know, I wasn't married at the time, easily enough to live on. And then I got a supplement and that was paid into a bank account in Britain. And I never needed it. So in other words, that part of the British aid to the programme never actually left Britain. Now, there are many other examples. I remember when I was there seeing um, uh, basically a new agricultural training centre which was being built by money from the British aid organisation, the Freedom from Hunger campaign. And that could be built using local materials and local skills. Whereas if it had been built as a result of, say, German or British or French foreign aid, they would have specified all the equipment and even the building materials might actually come from the home countries. Certainly all the equipment would. Uh, so in a sense, again, I'm just saying that you really want a much higher quality of assistance. And of course, if you're seeing development assistance in part as reparation for past exploitation and indeed slavery, then it makes even more sense from a, an ethical point of view. But essentially, what we would certainly need to do is reinstate the Department for International Development, increase the budget as quickly as possible back to the 0.7%, and it would be agree to go higher. I would also want to see the kind of development assistance much more geared to what countries actually need, with a much stronger gender connection and a connection to those who are most in need, but crucially also, as a third point, directed very much uh, to essentially um, meeting the green needs and helping the transition across the global south. So these are just a few ideas. Um, 
obviously there's a there's a scope for doing all kinds of things with our current military system overall personally i would say get rid of the nuclear weapons immediately that would say what 200 billion pounds over the next uh, sort of 20 30 years a very big sailing saving but look at other things as well we at the moment have one quite good reputation in global terms we're pretty good at research in climate breakdown and oceanography it's one of the areas where britain does have an historic strength including in polar research i would want to see a huge expansion of that we have to know far more about the climatic and ocean systems the spending is a lot better than it was 20 30 years ago but thanks to the likes of trump uh, and essentially and also before that george bush uh, they were not the level they should have been in the united states get they're getting back up to where now personally i would like to see the british spending on applied uh, climate research doubled in the space of the first three or four years as far as the system could cope i mean if you look at that uh, you know there's extraordinary research, research ship uh, the um, David Attenborough. It's a marvellous piece of really good kit, uh, light level icebreaker, but capable of going for long periods in very difficult parts of the world. I would like to see at least two or three other ships of the same class and increase the level of Britain's capability to aid the system. The Germans have some very good centres, some other countries have as well. And Britain should also be aiding the climate and meteorological centres right across the global south. That is a, a key function that we could play. Beyond that, of course, we have to take a lead in essentially decarbonizing our own economies. And this, of course, is where things really have changed. We've discussed this once or twice in fairly recent um, uh, excellent debates, and I know you've had other very good people talking about this. But the point is that one of the transformations in recent years, in fact, it's a three-part transformation. People are now recognizing uh, the importance of climate breakdown and how we simply have to handle it quickly. Um, we also actually see the evidence of it. Climate research is getting better and better. It's more precise, but that in turn is leading to a worry because all our really sharp models are tending to underpredict the impact. Uh, and there are many of the climate scientists, particularly working in the Arctic area, are pretty staggered personally at the rate of change. It's even been more than the systems are predicting. But what has also happened extraordinarily is the ease and the cost of decarbonization has come right down. So essentially, if you imagine that election uh, and you've got an imaginary, genuinely radical government coming in, you would embark immediately uh, as a national emergency in a wholesale uh, scope of insulating houses in the quickest way to produce an early uh, increase in heat uh, capabilities. And that, of course, means, you know, there should be massive loft insulation. Um, there should be a real help for people to uh, essentially improve their houses. There should be a very big increase in, in the use of electricity for many other purposes. That would inquire, require, obviously, more wind farms on land and also at sea. And that is where one of the changes ha happened. You know, essentially, electricity generated from wind at sea marine turbines uh, is so much cheaper now than from any other means uh, people say well it is intermittent but you're now getting a new generation of wind turbines just being developed they're only at experimental stages or prototypes which are giant floating turbines anchored to seabeds but they can be anchored very deep down and these are so far offshore that if you have them over a wider area actually there is always wind blowing somewhere now, that's just a quick example, but there are many other examples. What I'm saying is that it is possible to decarbonize at the speed with it that is required. We need to be decarbonizing at 10% per year for the next 10 years, certainly for the next seven or eight years. If we were to do that, that could be started by a new government really very quickly. Uh, you know, you could get a response in terms of, apart, apart from anything else, easing fuel poverty uh, in, in a very short space of time. Now, I'm going on a bit, bit and we ought to have plenty of time for discussion. So I, I've just been trying to give you examples of really thinking about things in a different way. I may say, well, this is going to lead a load of money. We have the dear old Labour Party appearing to renege a bit on it, its commitments. It's going to use a huge amount of money that has also to be the starts of economic reform. We have to turn away from the excessive reliance on market fundamentalism, no doubt about that. 
Uh, I mean, one interesting bit that was came out only two or three weeks ago, um, two or three of the think tanks got together, including, I think it was the New Economics Foundation, and they worked out that a pretty modest 2% per year tax on the richest, I think it was 250 people and families, could actually produce an income of somewhere around 20 billion a year. Uh, it seems extraordinary, but what one has to remember is if you just take the richest thousand people in Britain, just the richest thousand, you know, it fit in a not very big cinema, um, they are currently, I wouldn't say are worth, they have a wealth uh, to their names of approximately 750 billion pounds. Uh, there's an extraordinary concentration of wealth, and that can begin to be tapped. You don't have to make it a revolutionary thing, and it would be resisted at any level that you could start with the non-doms. But the point is, we have an extremely unfair system, and that has to stop in some way. Now, could a government get in and do these kinds of things? I think, in fact, people are, are a lot closer to that than we perhaps realize. Uh, you know, the Labour Party had a dreadful problem for many different reasons in, in 2019. But if you look at its manifesto in 2017, virtually every one of the economic proposals uh, were actually uh, had majority support in Britain, some of them 60 or 70 percent. We tend, I think, to be uh, rather backward in thinking how far people will accept change if you have the right leadership. There's one other thing which I hesitate to go on to a little bit, but I think in some ways, one of the things that the British have is a problem of searching for an empire and not being able to find a new one. Um, it is so much built into the system, our culture, if you like. You know, we are a great country in the rest. It's not unlike Putin, Erdogan, um, to some extent, it's Trump as well, make America great again. But in the case of British, it's actually pretty endemic. The curious thing is, that supposing you had a Britain which was actually playing a very different role in the world, some of the examples I've given here, you might actually find that it suddenly finds it has a rather higher status from other angles because it's doing something different. And the point is that, you know, year by year, the climate thing is going to get worse on present trends. The more and more you have individual countries that are saying, we are doing something about this, everybody has to, we will cooperate, the more chance there is of that kind of thing happening. So I suppose what I'm saying, and I'm going on a bit now, so I will stop now. Uh, what I'm saying is that if you look at things in a very different way, and this is why I think groups like Rethinking Security could be very important, then essentially I think it means it's more likely to happen in the future. Keep on using that term, I think, I think, I think. Sorry about that. But I suppose the, the point about all this is that there are different ways of looking at things. And the more people who do look at it that way, the better. You know, you imagine a government coming in, which take things very differently. I think governments are going to have to change on the climate thing. And with a bit of luck, that will make us rethink wider issues of security because it's a different kind of threat and it simply has to be met. Um, I know I think I used this at a talk here a couple of years ago, this idea of a different definition, a definition of prophecy. And that is that prophecy is suggesting the possible. And essentially, uh, if you're suggesting the possible, what could happen, and linking it into what people know in their hearts must happen, I think you may be onto a winner there. Um, let me just leave it at that point. Do you, do you want to take a, a pause, Carl, in just for a couple of minutes, or do you want to go straight into the possibility of questions and discussion? I think we should go straight into questions. I've, I, I was just going to try to get you back onto the uh, the truth and integrity. Yes. <laughs> Um, if if we have the right leadership, you you just said, radical policies would be supported. And I've read recently that it only needs about twenty percent of the population to change their minds and prioritise the need for radical change for governments to have the political base to enact those changes. Um, what do you think the chances are with the current? Uh, well, the leadership that we see across the world re really jockeying for position and jacking up their own their own positions and prioritizing that above the need of of the of the rest of us of of the needs of the world. 
I, I'll ask you that correct question, and I, then I can scrutinise what's been going on on this on the screen. Frankly, not good. You see very little of this around. Um, you do see some politicians, some of the times, speaking in these kinds of terms. You do get it from the UN. You do not get it very much at national government level. Um, and essentially, it, it depends on what you mean by leadership. Does it have to be the sort of major political leaders, or can it be other people who sort of come to public attention? Or even, I mean, it's, the, it's about on the nature of leadership. I admit that our political systems at present uh, are very much hierarchical systems. Um, can that be changed at all? Or can you at least see in some places the beginnings of leaderships which are uh, of, a, of a higher quality, if you like? I mean, you, we probably all know some individual politicians in Britain who we actually admire, uh, and, and some MPs who are actually doing obviously good work. Um, I think it has to be at least partly down to us to make demands of people uh, and to work to try and ensure that sort of people do come through. I mean, on the climate breakdown side, who would you say has had the most influence in the last five years? Probably Greta Thunberg, a Swedish schoolgirl originally. Uh, um, so it, it doesn't have to come so much from the, the huge leadership. What you want to, almost is poli political leaders who sense that the times are changing and they better change with them. And if you get leaders who are capable of doing that, then that is where I think you may have hope. Um, and essentially, it, there's no option but to work for it. Uh, and we, we have to accept that. I mean, we're all in the same game. And it's a question of how we can aid this process. Is that one gone? All right. Um, thank you, Paul. Hugh Grant and Patsy Wilson both ask, what do you think individuals can do to, to bring about change at a local le level and to spread your positive thinking among MPs and electors? It depends. I think this is where you had to play party politics to extent. Um, and let's say, imagine that, that you deal with, with your local MP is first of all um, a Labour MP uh, who may have some potential to have an impact, uh, a minor impact, and then look at a Conservative MP. With a Labour MP, I think you need to speak in these positive terms, sketch out a very different way of what Labour could do. It, I've concentrated a bit this morning on the security thing, and that's a tricky one because Labour at the leadership level currently has a real problem with security. Uh, it is scared stiff of being considered unpatriotic. Mm. And it would just, it will not, not, not only will it toe the line, it'd be quite militaristic as an understanding. But if you're, if you're actually saying to people, we are wasting huge amounts of money in this. And, you know, we fought, what, several failed wars. I mean, Britain has been a core part of Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and the recent war against ISIS. And the first have been utter disasters. Libya's have been a disaster. And ISIS is expanding across Central Africa. So in other words, the way we've been fighting wars uh, has made matters worse in all cases. So contrast that with the government, which is looking at the nature of the threats. I think you must focus on this one issue. I know I keep going on about it, of climate breakdown. That is a threat to all of us. It's a challenge, if you like, to use that term, to all of us. And I think you can probably get that across more to a Labour MP. Uh, so really present a different way of looking at things and just make them think they probably never occurred to them in many cases. I think the same would apply to um, um, the Lib Dems as well. And if you're in, in one of the nationalist areas, it perhaps applies less in Scotland because so many of the Scottish nationalists are onto this already. Uh, and we tend to forget that. And to some extent, um, people supporting Welsh nationalism as well. As far as the Conservatives are concerned, well, frankly, it's very difficult. But I think essentially some Conservatives are much more internationalist than others. Uh, at the MP level, uh, it is probably relatively small these days. It was better 20, 30 years ago, or always rather paternalistic. And it's worth remembering that surprises do happen. To give her due, Margaret Thatcher, with the science background, got the ozone problem at an early stage and actually help take action on that. Uh, so th it's not an easy one, but I think if you start talking in a way that people haven't heard before, that are, and it's positive, then I think that's, those are good starters for how to 
to, to have sort of some, some kind of effect. Thank you, Paul. Um, Tony Compton asks, how much of a problem are the right-wing media, especially the tabloids, and can anything be done about that? Uh, a big problem, and I don't see any way directly to do anything about them. Um, so the, not all the papers are as bad. I mean, The Guardian is, on some issues, relatively better, but most are pretty appalling because they are, obviously, they're run by uh, billionaire companies or conglomerates, and their interest is absolutely in maintaining the current system. And so it's going to be very difficult to get change, except um, when they actually have to report why their own policies are failing, particularly on the climate side. Um, but we, we, you have to work on regardless of that. Of course, public opinion is far less uh, dependent on what the newspapers are saying these days. Um, if I might say so, I think it'd be true to say that the majority of people who've been to network to uh, Hexen debates in recent years have been over 30, perhaps even over 50, who knows? And the point is we tend to read the print media more than younger people. So I think one has to remember that younger audiences are not even reading the print media. The problem, of course, is that so much of a cue uh, is actually taken from those media by the broadcast media. And we now have two television channels, which are specifically uh, very conservative with a small c in nature, which makes it more difficult. Again, that against that, of course, you have all the new social media. You know, you have groups like Rethinking Security, Declassified UK, Open Democracy, and many, many others, which are giving a much more accurate picture of the world, at least uh, as I see it. Uh, but it's a big problem, but it's one that we have to face up to. And as where you have any opportunity to put sort of a degree of influence on these things, including talking to people who might work in the field, in the media, then it is imperative to do so. Well, here's a, a, a comment as well as a question from Richard Craven, who I happen to know is coming in from Toronto, which is currently uh, suffering from the effects of the wildfires. Surely, he says, the only real change during the past 50 years is climate breakdown. Everything else is just the same. Hasn't the world always had its tyrants? Did colonialism create equality? Has the dynamic of the military-industrial complex changed since 1961? It's a spot-on question, Richard. It really is. Um, in one sense, I, I agree with you about climate change, but at two different levels. I think it's a climate breakdown. Um, it is, I think, patently obvious that this is now the existential challenge. And one uses the term existential, it's, it's overused, but in this case, it probably does apply. There are risks. There's the pandemic risk, the nuclear risk, uh, the AI risk. But climate breakdown is actually happening. We know it and we see it. And in the past 40, 50 years that I've worked in the security field, it's come up the agenda markedly. But the issue is it's more than that. Um, uh, in two different ways. If you look at how the military responds to the risk of climate breakdown, um, then it really, many people on the, in the military think tanks do think quite long term, and they get climate breakdown. If you read some of the stuff which comes out of the MOD funded to defense, um, was it the DCDC center, uh, which actually looks, defense concepts and, and um, Conduct and uh, I can't remember that anyway, it doesn't matter. DCDC, uh, you'll get it if you actually Google it. It's an interesting think tank. It's done lots of reports about the risk of climate breakdown, but the military tend to see that in the context of their role is to defend the realm rather than actually predict the problems and get politicians to prevent them happening. Um, that, in a sense, has to change. You have to have people within the military telling politicians, we can't handle climate breakdown, you've got to prevent it. But the other thing is, it's also, I think, very, very obvious that climate breakdown requires very good cooperation between governments and really stronger governance within countries that are doing it. In other words, it runs directly against the neoliberal uh, culture in a way, even the ideology. So it actually climate breakdown indirectly challenges the way our current economy works as well. And this is why, in some ways, quite apart from the actual risks it poses, it is also, I would say, really very important in terms of the longer term, because if we really 
learn how to handle climate breakdown. Or we have to really get to grips with that and face it head on within the next five to seven years, I think by 2030. If we do that, it'll also become more and more apparent we can only be effective against the greatest threat to humankind if we change that, our economic model. There has to be some sort of thing which is much more, much more cooperative than we have at present. But yes, um, it is the one changing factor uh, that we see. Uh, and yes, Richard, I would agree with you, but it goes further than what we normally think. It isn't just a problem. It actually throws light on the wider inequalities uh, and failures of the way that society works at the present time. We are facing, I mean, I think one person put it years ago, that, you know, humankind has had, what, uh, three revolutions. The agricultural revolution, um, what's it, sort of seven to 11,000 years ago, when we learned to farm and stopped hunter-gathering as the major means of existence. That includes the population hugely. The second was the industrial revolution, uh, which has led to huge increases in the human impact on the environment. The third revolution, which is just starting, is the post-industrial revolution, where we have to come to terms with the inability of the world ecosystem to handle growing human impacts. And remember, you know, if you go back to the that original remarkable document, Limits to Growth, back in 71, 72, came out at the time of the first um, uh, UN Environment Conference in Sweden, that wasn't predicting sudden collapse. What they were saying, there are many economists decried it, say it's a load of sort of doom watch stuff. Limits to growth, I mean, the, the woman who led it, Danella Meadows, is hugely under-recognized in terms of her significance, uh, perhaps less so than Rachel Carson 20 years earlier, who was also really hugely important. But the point is, it was actually saying, limits to growth, that the real problems are going to arise in the 2020s and 2030s. So that was basically... 50 years ago is what these people were saying. Uh, and now we're now seeing that. So it's a seminal change. And it's a once only opportunity to get to grips with the fact we are living way beyond our means. In equal, unequal as well, but broadly beyond our means. Society has to be made a lot more equal and also a lot more cooperative with each other. And we're going to be forced to do that Otherwise, it's going to be a disaster unfolding within us in the middle of it. Thank you. Can I just pick you up on a, a, a comment you made at the beginning of, of that uh, response to Richard? Um, if it's the military that, that can see climate breakdown as a problem that they can't be expected to control, what chance have they got to influence government? What you know, are there buttons that they can press? Are there lanes that they can access that uh, ordinary rank and file people like ourselves can't? I, what you would need is, well, for a start, you would need recently retired senior officers saying it as it is. Uh, there'd be one or two, but nothing like enough. Then you basically want, you know, really thoughtful military leaders of a pretty high level in terms of rank to actually be saying that we have to do this, uh, that they come out in the open and saying, yes, we've got all the problems at present, there's Ukraine and the rest, but the reality is this overshadows everything, absolutely everything. And it means that we've got to be prepared to basically tell governments, get real about this. You know, we're playing around with this and this has to there had to be massive changes and don't expect us to pick up the pieces because we don't think it's going to be possible to um it's a very it's a very brave message to put from a military to a government but if you start to see it happening that is the kind of thing which will have a greater impact on politicians if they're told that they're doing things which will make the world much more violent and unstable and if military people are telling them and telling you they can't keep the lid on things, they can't practice lidism or keep the lid on things, then that might have an impact. How you get that to happen, again, I don't know. It's, it's not easy to say. Maybe I'm just saying that this is the kind of change we have to envisage and start thinking along these lines. You know, mm -hmm. when we're looking about the vision of a different kind of Britain, it's quite nice and easy to do it on paper and it can sort of improve it. 
improve our thinking and maybe think more positively. But at the same time, it always always comes up with the difficult thing. Well, how are we going to make it happen? And the answer is straightforwardly, I do not know. But there are pointers to it. And I think what you can do is always probe, but always remember it could be very different. And the more important thing, it has to be very different. And that, I think, as Richard was saying, is the real change that climate breakdown and its risk brings into us. Thank you. John Dark mm -hmm. asks, uh, he says, the ozone problem was solved because there was an easy solution. Uh, Non-carbon solutions should be sold on their, uh, I think he must mean on the, their benefit to the economy rather than just the principle that uh, it's going to stop the climate crisis. Yes, I mean, uh, that I think is, you know, if you want to look at one positive change in recent years, and that has been the way in which the ability to uh, generate electricity from renewable sources is being transformed. And it's one of the very few core sources of optimism that you can see. But it is happening, and it's happening very quickly. I'm lucky in this respect. One of our sons is a renewable energy engineer. And you know he's been lecturing on this for, what, 15 years or so. And he sort of keeps us really up to date. Um, I might be repeating things we've discussed in previous uh, Hexham debates. So bear with me if you like. But just to give you a couple of examples, my wife, Claire, was very keen for us to get a PV array on our house uh, 12 or 15 years ago. We were very early in the in the process. And essentially, we got around to doing it. And it, it's, uh, I think we started the, the new system uh, 12 years ago. And as a photovoltaic system on the roof of the house, it cost a lot of money. Uh, and it, it really pushed us at the time. It cost 11 and a half thousand pounds. But that produced uh, what was a, a 3.8 kilowatt array, which essentially makes the house carbon neutral. Um, and essentially, because at the time, this was the legacy of the Labour government, which has continued under the Lib Dems and their influence on the coalition government, we had a very good what was called feed-in tariff. So in fact, that system has now just about paid for itself. That same system uh, now costs, I think, about £4,500. Whereas if you take the 11500 at prices, what, uh, 12 years ago, we're talking about what probably 14,000. So from 14,000 to 14,500, the government, of course, has virtually got rid of the feed in tariff. An incoming government, all it has to do is not put the feed in tariff up to what it was before, but put it up to enough which will encourage people. And as you had 15 years ago, there was a sudden development of an industry in this, in that electricians learned how to fit these things and roofers learned how to actually uh, install them. And essentially, that produced a sort of a rapid development of, of root-up uh, PV. And that was basically more or less killed dead by a political decision in 2015. That could come back. And very quickly, just as I say with insulation, you could get a change there. So it's an example of how quickly things can happen and can happen in a way that you couldn't have said eight or ten years ago. And then the other example, a good one, is near where we live on the East Pennines, there is the Royds Moor wind farm, uh, a wind farm which was sort of real state of the art when it was built over 25 years ago, in fact, nearly 30 years ago now. And in fact, it probably will replace fairly soon. And that was, an, was it a 13 uh, turbine system producing at maximum uh, nine kilowatts of power, sorry, nine megawatts of power, megawatts, not kilowatts. Um, a current offshore wind turbine, a single turbine could be rated at 10 megawatts. And they're now developing 15 megawatt ones, which float deep offshore. So in other words, one turbine is as big as an entire wind farm of 30 years ago. Again, and far more efficient. So those are the sorts of examples of things that can happen. One always has to bear this in mind. I've gone on a bit of a tangent in a way now, but essentially I can't remember where we started with this question. But the point is, things can change. Yes, I remember what it was. Basically, you can sell people on the idea that, oh, by the way, it's actually cheaper to do it this. Um, and one has to resist the very strong pressures from the oil and gas companies uh, not to do it. Uh, and this is one area where governments have to act and act really consistently. And that does in core include windfall taxes for sure. Thank you, Paul.
Um, John Dark just ha has a supplementary comment, if you can bring that up on the screen. Yeah, sure. um, he says, should, should we be asking the government to insist that all new builds with south-facing roofs have PV installed? It well, seems so obvious to, sorry, yeah. to, to change the building re regulations. Why are we still building houses that aren't properly insulated? Why are we still installing gas boilers, which will have to be ripped out in five months' time? You know, it's ridiculous. Building yeah. regs. Well, no, it's worse than that, because, in fact, that was all planned in, I think it was the 2016 um, Green Plan, uh, which had been developed originally by Labour and kept on essentially by Lib Dem influence. But essentially, that was just scrubbed completely in 2015. Um, the house builders, and there are only four or five really big ones, didn't really want to do this because they were afraid that it wouldn't be so profitable. And essentially, the government of the day, I'll be blunt about this, was not interested. Whatever it said in public, it wasn't interested. Uh, I mean, I'll give an example again. You may have heard this before, but it's a valid one. I got invited to um, um, a conference about, it was in fact 2012, when two years into the coalition government. And it was an oil and gas industry conference. And I was there basically to talk about some aspect of Middle East security. But it was a, a one-day meeting, lunchtime to lunchtime, at an extremely posh country hotel, and the cost was £1,000 for the 24 hours. I got it for free because I was doing a talk, because I went and I stayed for the whole time because of it. But essentially, they had a recently retired senior government minister telling them not to worry about this climate thing, that we don't really believe it, but we're in a coalition, so we have to go along with it. At that time... Uh, the, the essentially the prevailing political mood on the British right was climate change was not significant and if anything was a danger. And so this is why so many things were ditched in 2015 when you had a majority government in power. I'm sorry to be blunt about this, I know it's part of political, but that's the reality. And even in, in recent years, governments had to be dragged kicking and screaming to accept what is obvious. The only change recently has been the way in which some of the bigger industries and some big companies like Siemens have actually found it is more profitable to produce green industries. But, you know, it shouldn't have had to come to that. We should have been ahead of the game. And this is where absolutely a government of a more radical persuasion could have a very big impact for very, very little cost. You know, the whole business of just subsidising people enough to put in loft insulation. I mean, my local authority had a bit of a windfall when there was a privatisation of Leeds Bradford Airport about 12, 15 years ago. And because the, the Greens had a bit of a say in it, and because of some sort of thoughtful councillors, they put most of the money into a warm zone scheme. And you, you got free loft insulation, completely free. They came, surveyed your loft. If you had some, they said you need more. If you don't have any, you said we'd fit it. And they fitted most of the houses in the entire area. Uh, and that's the kind of thing, it's not very costly. And it has a return very quickly. There's so much that can be done that isn't being done, I suppose. And this is where we had to just keep pushing relentlessly. Well, yeah, Paul, you always manage to find something positive to give us hope. Uh, it's very tempting to look at the, the current corruption and uh, general feebleness uh, and, and feel that nothing can be done. But it can be done, and it's down to us to help to do it. Governments will have to get out of the way and let it happen. Greta Thunberg said, to change everything, we need everybody. And I hope we all sign up to, to, to that thought. Paul, thank you so much for once more bringing a series of the Hexham debates to a rousing finish. We're very, very grateful to you for turning out so faithfully for us. And uh, we all enjoyed listening to you very much indeed and gone away with hope in our hearts. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.